Good afternoon. My name is Amy Ryan, president of the Boston Public Library, and it is an honor and a pleasure to welcome you to the Boston Public Library for the Boston Book Festival. First of all, I'd like to thank all the staff, and particularly Deborah Porter, the executive director and founder of the Boston Book Festival, for this amazing lineup this weekend of content-rich programs. So you can imagine my intense interest in this program, the future of reading, and all of us in the library world are, so I'm looking forward to hearing your comments. And what I'd like to do now is introduce the moderator, Sepp Kambar. It's my pleasure to be here today, and, and I'd like to start by thanking Debbie and her team by putting on such a great event. Nice. It's been wonderful to spend the day here. Uh, it's very exciting for me to be on this particular panel because it cuts to the heart of what this event is all about, reading, and what the future of reading is. Um, and I'm excited to have with me some of the most thoughtful people on this matter that I've seen, and I'll introduce them now. Nicholas Negroponte, who is the founder of the MIT Media Lab, also the founder of One Laptop Per Child, and the chairman of One Laptop Per Child and the former director of the MIT Media Lab. <laughs> Marianne Wolf is the director of the reading and language research at Tufts University and also a professor at Tufts as well. <laughs> Cheryl Toto is the, is the senior vice president for planning and strategy at Houghton Mifflin. <laughs> Baratunde Thurston is a comedian, author of the book How to Be Black. Uh, and also the former director of digital for The Onion. And Robert Darton is, uh, is the director of the Harvard University Libraries and a professor at Harvard University. So we're going to start out by having each of the panelists give a four-minute presentation on what they see as the future of reading, and we'll go into dis a discussion from there. Uh, and we'll start with Nicholas. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> I modestly suggested I go first uh, because I wanted to talk about the basics, not particularly advocate one future or another. And in thinking about it over the years, I realize there's a very distinct difference between the future of words and the future of paper. And they get conflated. And then, once you tease those apart, there's a very big difference in the general topic on the future of narrative, whether the narrative you know, loses some of the value and interest in long form because our attention spans have gone down, or whether narrative is instead of one medium has multimedia and then uses the brain differently. So I wanted to separate those and then say a word on media, again, in the very general sense. So many times people tell me, oh, we went from the tablet to the scroll to the book to we got maybe sent, and we sort of went, and now we have another one called digital. Rubbish. Digital is not on the continuum of the others. It's the basic DNA that for the first time allows us to represent this body that can then, from those bits, be turned into video or photography or images or words or sounds or whatever. And also in a very general tone, the future of words themselves is, a big, is bigger. They're not going to go away, and, and let's talk about the visual form more than the audio form for a moment. They're represented by bits. And some people think digital books are new. Digital books have basically been every book in the past 40 years is in digital form for a typesetter. And then it becomes undigital once it's on paper. But almost all of the books you've read in your life were phototype set from a digital representation of the book. So that, that part isn't new. And the bits that take to make a letter and then the number of bits and words and so on is very small. 
a novel is about 8 million, maybe 10 million bits. Mm -hmm. And when you click a photograph on your new high resolution camera, you're taking about 8 million bits. So you say, wow, what a difference it takes me four hours to read the ones in text form, but I can glance at those. And so the ratio of bits is a very fundamental issue because we can store all the books. And then I want to make one last general remark about ebooks. There is no question that the form, once they're all represented digitally, should be at least distributed electronically because there's no weight and there's no inventory and there's, they travel at the speed of light. And what's going to be the, the thing that tilts this is the fact that there are one billion new readers headed our way, humans who can read in the next five years. And those billion people cannot be sent pieces of paper. It's not possible. You cannot mail paper to one billion readers, let alone update it and do all those things. But we're going to lose something. And one of the things we lose, and people are very nostalgic, including me, is that when you have things called books, you have built into that the memory. People have, most people have libraries. When you walk into your library, you can remember when you read every book that you've read in that library. You can remember where it is on the shelf. You can probably remember the color of the spine. You remember how heavy it is. So there are certain things that are going to disappear, like they do with digital music. We don't have CDs. We don't have things. But again, you have to separate these. And once you compartmentalize them and you realize that the basic DNA is digital, then the future of reading is really high, but the future of paper is really low. That's my four minutes. Great. Perfect I love timing. the timer. <laughs> so, so, do you have my PowerPoint in there? You, I have you, to have my PowerPoint. Go for it. Okay. Who's the person who said it? I think it'll, it'll, it'll appear on the yeah. screen in a moment. Okay, good. I don't want to take one second. You've heard of TED Talks that are very brief. This is the mm. talk from BBF. <laughs> <laughs> um, the reality is a little different, I believe, than what Nicholas is saying. And uh -oh. I, I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, she didn't. Uh, I, I need someone to come here and show me where the uh, Seth? clicker is here. Seth. Oh, oh clicker. Clicker's, good, clicker's good. here. Okay, I lost 30, 30 seconds on that one. <laughs> now, the, how many of you heard Ray Kurzweil a few minutes ago speak? So, fantastic talk. When he was talking about pattern recognition, pattern recognition as a piece of the neocortex, this is something that I want to actually clarify for you a little bit in the story of the reading brain. I'm going to ask three questions. As a cognitive neuroscientist and as a member of the species who will steward, I believe, this next generation with these questions. First, can the evolution of the reading brain inform the future reading brain? Can insights into the reading brain influence the future of books? And can Socrates and Proust provide guideposts to both? Now, what you see here are the multiple circuits that are possible. Now, before when you saw this, this is somewhat what Ray Kurzweil was talking about. We build a circuit. Uh, my dear friend Nicholas was saying the DNA digital. There's no DNA for reading. It is not natural. Rather, what reading does is show us how the brain learns something new, how it creates a new circuit from old parts. And if you look at this, you're going to see how each writing system, in fact, uses a different circuit. Now, the good news is that this shows us the extraordinary nature of neuroplasticity. But there's a cerebral rub. It also indicates to us there's no one reading brain. It's going to be very influenced, not only by the writing system, but by the medium itself. And that's what I believe our society is in this enormous transition. Whatever words we use, it's a transition from a more literate, print-based society to a digital culture. How does that affect us? Now, those of you who have read a little bit about Natalie Phillips' new work on Jane Austen, the brain, an English major looking into neuroscience, what she found is that the brain, when it reads intensely, what I call deep reading, is...